ambulance went flying by and I could see in the, in the corner just like a bunch of lights and stuff. A quiet afternoon takes a sudden turn in a Loveland neighborhood. This just doesn't happen here. Tonight, we're hearing from neighbors as crime tape goes up on their street. I'm tracking rain that's moving through the high country tonight. When we'll see more rain here in the metro area on Friday. It's not all about Russ. The Broncos defense also has high expectations heading into the fall. Day in and day out, you know, just a talent all across the board. Denver 7 sports teams getting you all caught up on day two of training camp. And we begin tonight with new details about what happened at this home in Loveland. Just in the past hour, Loveland police confirmed two people were found shot to death. Police also say there were three juveniles hiding in the home. They were safely removed. And we have learned the person police are calling the possible suspect in this case is dead. Denver 7's Rob Harris is live at the scene near Aries Drive in Pavo Court with reaction from neighbors. Rob, there is some indication these people knew one another. Yeah, and that is the sense we're getting after talking to some neighbors here, though we do not have that confirmation from police yet. As you can see behind me, police are still here on scene several hours after this incident took place as they continue that investigation. The crime tape is still up, though people who live on the street are able to go past the crime tape and get to their homes at this point. Now, police say it was just after 2 o'clock this afternoon that they arrived on scene. They'd gotten a call about a weapon here. It was at that same time that neighbors tell me they heard two loud bangs, which they now know to have been gunshots. But at the time, they did not know that. They actually tell me they thought the trash cans had been blown over because they don't experience things like this in the neighborhood very often. They then heard screaming from a woman and kids, and they describe a flood of officers pouring into the neighborhood with guns drawn surrounding the house. After about 45 minutes, neighbors say they heard a flashbang outside the home's door, and that's when they saw police go inside to get three kids out who were hiding. I want you to listen to the way one neighbor I talked to describe all this happening outside her front door. We get out here and look and we, there's just people, guns drawn. I mean, the, the SWAT team was here and just kids screaming in the streets and it was just like, what is happening here? And you could just see something in the yard. There was a white sheet over it. So I just all of a sudden it went into a panic and it just didn't look good. Now, police have identified the possible suspect as Javier Acevedo. A neighbor did tell me that a man by that name lived at the house at one point, and police say he was found in Erie where he had shot and killed himself. They tell us that there's no further known threat to the community at this point. Anne. Rob Harris, thank you. We're also learning about a shooting in Fort Collins. Tonight, the Lamar County Sheriff says they're looking for a 15-year-old suspect. The shooting happened just after 4 p.m. on the 400 block of South Overland Trail. A 28 year old man was found with multiple gunshot wounds. He was taken to the hospital and investigators say the suspect and victim do know each other. Our Denver 7 weather action day continues tonight and while we've stayed dry in the metro tonight, we could see more chances for rain tomorrow. Meteorologist AC Donaldson is joining us now with a first look at the forecast. Ace. Well, a few changes in the last 24 hours tweaked that forecast just a little bit, so we really haven't seen much rain here for the metro area. It was that cold front last night that brought in the cooler temperatures, the cloudy skies. We didn't have quite enough upslope here for our area, so a lot of stability in the atmosphere, but more rain is expected for tomorrow afternoon. We still have flood watches in effect for Southern Colorado for tomorrow. That's where we're also seeing the rain continuing. So mostly into Southern Colorado at this point, we haven't seen a whole lot moving through our northern mountains, but from Alamosa out toward Pueblo and just south of Colorado Springs, we still have the rain moving through. We're not expecting any here for the metro area as we go through the rest of tonight. We could see a few scattered showers off and on, but mostly cloudy skies here as we go through the overnight instead of the big lightning show that we've seen the last couple of evenings. Now tomorrow we still have chances for rain. I'll let you know what our chances are for flooding coming up in a few minutes. All right, sounds good. Now that storm last night, it dropped between two and three inches of rain in Boulder, raising concerns over potential flooding. Denver 7's Colette Bordelon live in Boulder along the creek path after talking with the city, Colette, uh, about how they plan for these big rains. That's right, and guys, the sky was gray today, but no rain so far this afternoon. Lots of rain last night, like Stacy was saying, and she was also telling me there's more rain expected tomorrow night. So the rain from Wednesday, though, it fills up in the ground. When it does that, it doesn't allow other water to absorb into the soil. That's what creates the potential for floods. And in 2013, Boulder had a flood that was so destructive. No one can forget it. The people who lived here definitely can't. For instance, where I'm standing right now along the Boulder Creek path, I would have been completely swept away by that water. And it's floods like that 
that hammer home the point of why Boulder needs such a special infrastructure in this city. Along the Boulder Creek path. It's really a special place. Are people like Mark Painter who love this city. We're right at the base of the mountains. A city that can be temperamental when it comes to the weather. Worse floods every time we have a fire. And nearly a decade ago, in September of 2013, Boulder was scarred by a flood it won't forget. Pretty traumatic. Somebody died just, just about a half a mile from my house. The city says more than 18 inches of rain fell, causing in some areas a 100-year flood event, meaning the chances that could happen on any given year are only 1%. By the Boulder Creek, the water reached to the 50-year flood mark. It was actually different across the city. It wasn't, it wasn't a 100-year event everywhere. Boulder has the highest risk of flash flooding among all Colorado cities. It was developed in the late 1800s. That was before modern floodplain regulation, says Joe Tadayuchi, the director of utilities for the city. Like a lot of older cities, we're playing catch up. Since the flood, a number of projects have been completed, like replacing large rocks along the middle of the creek which slows how fast the water flows. The 2013 flood was so extreme that it, it moved those big rocks that were the size of cars. There's still some fear for residents when the skies turn gray. Boulder has done a great job with its flood channeling and it still isn't always enough. But the improvements to their city, one of many reasons they stay. While people are very careful and a little concerned, um, it's worth it. It's still worth living in. To learn more, you can go to boulderfloodinfo.net. Live in Boulder, Colette Bordeaux on Denver 7. All right, Colette, the recent rain has helped our drought just a little bit. The U.S. Drought Monitor says 97% of the state is still considered abnormally dry. That's the same as last week. However, there are fewer areas of Colorado considered to be in a moderate or severe drought compared to last week. Now, the data was collected before Tuesday and Wednesday storms, so next week's update could provide a little more promising picture. Day two of Broncos training camp at the UC Health Training Center. There's been a lot of hype this offseason surrounding quarterback Russell Wilson. That's right. There's also high expectations for the Broncos defense. Here is our sports director, Lionel Bienvenu. Yeah, guys, football is back day two, and the headline reads, it takes two to win a title, offense and defense. No man is an island. Russell Wilson, nope, not even him. It takes Russell Offense, defense, all that to contend for a championship. Here are some of the sights and sounds of day two. Russell uh, will get things started every day, looks like, by high-fiving the fans in the front row. Justin Simmons also went over there today with uh, some special guests from the Denver Broncos Boys and Girls Club. Then Sierra and the Wilson kids made their way onto the practice field again. Looks like they're going to come see Russ as much as they can as well. And then he went over for some pre-practice hugs. And the kicker is playing catch with the fans as well. Now, as we said, it was a day for the defense. And here's Broncos insider Troy Rank to kick off our coverage. First things first, the secondary put on a show on the second day of Broncos training camp. Justin Simmons looked like Willie Mays running across the field with a leaping deflection of a pass. Oh, that was awesome. Simmons told me afterward he's learned with Wilson his deep ball has more velocity and stays in the air longer. This play, it turned heads. That one right there was was pretty dramatic. So I think because uh, we were actually trying to pick on somebody else and then he came over and uh, and helped out. So I thought, I mean, it, that was an amazing play. I mean, that, that was unbelievable. Moments later, Pat Sertan showed why he could be an all pro this season. He leaped up and clubbed the ball away from Cortland Sutton. Now listen, Sertan remains humble, but he told me this secondary should be special. I believe we're a top five secondary, like day in and day out, you know, just the talent all across the board, the veteran leadership we have. Um, we just come out here and make plays each and every day. So I believe we're a top five secondary, even a top secondary in the league. So, you know, we're just going to keep on proving that and keep on show showcasing our abilities. Javante Williams is getting the first reps with the first team, but Melvin Gordon then rotates and gets the next set of reps with the first team. Hackett said afterward, there is room for both in this offense. Reporting from UC Health Training Center, Troy Rank, Denver 7. All right, thanks, Troy. One of the biggest questions of camp, what is that? A blue grenade? A large Lego piece? A mushroom? Is it Megamind? Nope, it's a piece of safety equipment designed to cut down on the risk of head injuries. Here's Nick Rothschild with more. 
I noticed a lot more guys wearing these guardian caps at camp this year. It's because the NFL made them mandatory for all linemen, linebackers, and tight ends. So I asked around to see how the Broncos feel about the new headgear. I wanted to ask about the guardian protectors on the helmets. Uh, oh, I mean, they're kind of ugly, but... They're not necessarily the best fashion statement. I was thinking about wearing one, but I... I decided not to. Kind of just makes my head feel heavy. Kind of feel like a bobblehead, man. I feel like it adds like, well, it gives me negative five speed on Madden. We have a joke in the O-line, O-line room. Uh, we won't be getting any good pictures in, in training camp with these on. <laughs> well, I don't want any pictures. Okay, no pictures for Draymond Jones, but his opinion was stronger than mere flash photography. Hate him, Why? can't stand him. Why? He just looks silly. I feel like I just don't feel all the way like myself because I got this crazy extra pattern thing, but you know, NFL, you know, not gonna undermine them, not gonna undercut them. This is their rule and I'm a part of the league, so whatever they say, I'll follow. The NFL made this move because they found that guardian caps reduce impact severity by at least 10%. But does it make these guys feel more safe? It's hard to tell. When we put on the shoulder pads, I'll be able to, you know, really see when we're really like striking and, and hitting each other. But yeah, I feel like it's gonna help me protect me against any concussions or anything like that. And I feel like, you know, once we get pads on, I'll be more prone to just fly in, you know, without worrying about getting injured and stuff like that. You know, it prolongs our career, it makes us better people in the community. You know, anyone that suffers from CT is not a fun thing. On the real serious note, it, it really is to protect us, and you know, I'm thankful for that. Coach Hackett also says it can save a quarterback from hitting his hand on a lineman's helmet. So for a little extra safety, they'll suffer the strange look. At UC Health Training Center, I'm Nick Rothschild. All right, Nick, that's a wrap on day two. Day three tomorrow starts with practice at 10 a.m. A new report raising more concerns over a possible recession. What you can do to prepare, why the White House is striking a more optimistic tone. Headed to nationals. Said, you know what, if any of you qualify, I will personally pay for you to get there. Denver 7 viewers helping high school wrestlers get to one of their sport's biggest stages.